well welcome again to part two of two of the presentation from Gethsemane to Calvary, the trial of Jesus Christ. And we are looking behind the scenes uh, to the Jewish nation who crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. These are excerpts from uh, the book, uh, Behold the Man, author being uh, Taylor Bunch. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that uh, there is a lot you have revealed unto us that is enough for our salvation. And Lord, help us not to be ignorant of our history, that Lord, we may not repeat the same things in a very negative way. Help us stick to truth and Lord, not be separated from it, not sell it at any cost. And uh, whether the heavens or the earth fall, help us to still be true as the needle is to the pole. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so in uh, part one, we looked at um, the Sanhedrin, the people who were behind the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And uh, we saw how if they could have followed the laws they had put in place, it was in favor of the person who was accused. No one could have even been condemned if their system, uh, they adhere to their system. But after looking at all the corruptions, the bribery, and um, the savaging of their own rules, we want to look at the Jewish people themselves. After looking at the officials of the nation, let us look at the people themselves. I'll start... Um, with something, with a quote which I'll finish up with, which is um, one is same, one is same, one is same, four or six, paragraph one. We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not have understand it. We do not take have take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a four we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the people of God in the experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jewish, and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. And uh, in the story of uh, the sleeping disciples, uh, we saw that um, in uh, 2205 paragraph 1, the Son of God went away the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, that will be done. And again he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Their eyes were heavy. By this sleeping disciples is represented a sleeping church. When um, the day of God's visitation is night. It is a time of clouds and thick darkness when to be found asleep is most perilous. And so we find that um, the Jewish uh, leaders actually sought every occasion to be misled. Satan sought every occasion to mislead these people, and in turn they misled uh, uh, the officials, and then the uh, Satan misled the officials, and in turn they misled the people. And so, at the time that we are living in, because history repeats itself and God demands of those things that have been, we should be careful that we do not repeat the same thing following after the leaders, instead of um, clinging on the arm of Jesus Christ, which is strong. And also we should be wary of uh, the anti-type of uh, the sleeping disciples. That um, this is not the time to sleep. It is perilous time. And so after looking at uh, the officials and how they crucified Jesus Christ, let us uh, look at the people. Why was Christ condemned to death by this government and by the people? The 
only hope of the enemies of Jesus to bring about his condemnation was a change of charges from sedition to blasphemy. The government of the Hebrews was considered a theocracy with Jehovah at his, as it is real king and ruler. For this reason, blasphemy was considered a form of prison with death by stoning as the penalty. It was one of the most serious offenses known to the Jewish. Uh, Salvador, the Jewish advocate, said the Senate declared that Jesus, son of Joseph, born at Bethlehem, had profaned the name of God in usurping it for himself, a simple citizen. The capital sentence was then pronounced. Jesus admitted the child that he claimed to be the son of God or the Messiah to be true, and on this confession he was condemned to die. In fact, the Jewish uh, people understood well when he said he is the son of God in, uh, when he said, I and my father are one, and when he used the name, I am the eternal presence of the Holy One of Israel. And then uh, they claimed that this was blasphemy. And so the use of false witnesses was a very grievous infraction of Hebrew law. And we saw that uh, the, if there came a false witness, the same sentence he was pushing upon the one he accused would fall on him if the accusation was found to be false. And the judges were on the side, they tried their best to be on the side of the accused, trying every way to uh, release him. But on the case of Jesus Christ, the judges bent on the other side against their own law, which demanded them to be on the side of the accused rather than the accuser. It not only disqualified a judge who was supposed to seek for evidence only in behalf of the accused, but it also condemned the false witness to suffer the penalty they sought to bring upon the accused. Those who testified falsely against Jesus were therefore themselves de deserving of death. For some time before his trial, the Jewish authorities had Jesus constantly shadowed by hired informers or spies, which was entirely unlawful according to the Mishnah and according to, uh, according to the Talmud and uh, according to the Mishnah and according to the Gemara. And so they watch him and send forth spies which will feign themselves just men that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and the authority of the governor. If you look at the book of Luke chapter 20 verse 20, there are people who always followed after Jesus Christ to contradict his statements. It was these paid spies who were brought forward to testify against Jesus and whose testimony was too contradictory to effect of uh, a conviction. This failure caused Caiaphas to change the charge to that of blasphemy, but Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus at that time said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, that Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven, then the high priest rained his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. And so what further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard him blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. And that is in Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 to 66. And so think of this for a second time. Just think about it. It was on the objection of the witnesses that Christ is the son of God and his contrary confession that led to Christ's crucifixion. As in the crucifixion of Jesus in the belief of begotten theology by saints and ongoing process daily by opposing of the same and can be categorized as a false witness themselves deserving death penalty. These are the very things that, um, you know, by Jesus Christ saying he's the son of God, he was condemned to death. And, uh, it was upon this theology that the Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. Why are people being disfellowshipped so much? It is on the basis of the theology that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so while we sit here and say, you know, in our days, we cannot crucify Jesus Christ. We are just repeating the same. When under the same belief, people are excommunicated, 
people are removed fellowship, people are censored, people are handed down like wolves. And we can stand on the pulpit and say, you know, if we were there in the times of the Jewish, we could have not crucified Jesus Christ when the same, same thing is happening unto us today. And are in the past, I by sense of the saints rending their clothes as Caiaphas did, and hence showing their unworthiness of the kingdom, they are so much zealous to protect as the Jewish and the priest were, but they found themselves not part of. As the priest rend his cloth and said, This is blasphemy. So today, in the disfellowshipping of the saint, that is blasphemy. They can say that. Now, Rabbi Weiss said, and uh, I'd like us to read this. I'd like us to have a, a look of, at this. Rabbi Weiss said, if none of the judges defend the culprit, i.e. all pronounce him guilty, having no defender in the court, the verdict of, of guilty was invalid and the sentence of death could not be executed. Now, this was the saying of the rabbis, and we saw that the saying of the rabbi was like the saying of God in their Mishnah, in their Talmud and Gemara. So if all these people came to a consensus that um, Jesus Christ was um, blaspheming and was worthy to death, all of them came with the same verdict. Then according to their own writings, we are told that um, if none of the judges defend the culprit, i.e. all pronounce him guilty, having no defender in the court, the verdict of guilty was invalid and the sentence of death could not be executed. And this is what could have happened to Jesus Christ. And this is in the Matadom of Jesus, page 74, Rabbi Weiss saying, This rule prevailed because Hebrew law did not permit any defense advocates. It was the duty of the judges to defend the accused and to see that he, reason, he received justice. In order to give the proceedings the proper element of mercy, the accused must have at least one friend among the judges to speak in his behalf. But what friend did Jesus have? Regarding this unusual rule, Chandler said, with the Anglo-Saxon jury, a unanimous verdict is necessary to convict. But with the Hebrews and Hedden, unanimity was fatal and resulted in acquittal. And so Jesus Christ could have not been killed by the Jewish people if they followed up their own laws. Now, if the verdict was unanimous in favor of condemnation, it was evident that the prisoner had had no friend or defender in court. To the Jewish mind, this was almost equivalent to mob violence. It argued conspiracy at least. The element of mercy, which was required to enter into a, the, every Hebrew verdict, was absent in such a case, but where all suddenly agree on conviction, does it not seem, ask a modern Jewish writer, that the convict is a victim of conspiracy and that the verdict is not the result of sober reason and calm deliberation? So even the people who are looking into the Jewish law, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Gemara, are finding that in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, there was no single judge who was a friend of Jesus. And that alone was the fact to let him go free. Because it was a law that at least a judge, one of the judges be a friend of the accused. So that to see that justice is done. We continue reading by uh, Robert Weiss. If the accused had... One friend in court, the verdict of condemnation will stand since the element of mass was present and the spirit of conspiracy or more violence was absent. The trial of Jesus, volume 1, page 280 to 281. That Jesus was condemned by a unanimous, unanimous vote of the Sanhedrin is evident from the scriptural record. As the result of the confession of Jesus that he was the son of God, Caiaphas told the judges that they had heard his blasphemy. He then asked for their verdict. They answered and said he is guilty of death. They all condemned him to be guilty of death in Matthew chapter 26, verse 66, and Mark 14, verse 64. 
Rabbi Wise acknowledges that the sentence against Jesus rested or a unanimous verdict of the judges. That Jesus had no intercessor to defend him is also evident from prophecy. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. I have trodden the one press alone and of the people there was none with me. And I looked and there was none to help and I wondered there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury, it upheld me. This is from Isaiah 59, 16 and Isaiah 63 verses 3 and 5. Jesus suffered the grossest injustice before the earthly tribunal without an intercessor that we might receive justice in the heavenly tribunal with him as our intercessor. Think about that for a minute. He who needed justice found no justice. And he, we who do not need justice, we have found justice because he who missed an intercessor now is our intercessor and he is able to save unto the uttermost. He is now able to save unto the uttermost. And to remain silent to the direct question as to whether he was the Messiah would have been to the decided personal advantage of Jesus. He will also have been within his legal right as no accused person was compelled to say or to do anything that would be prejudicial to his case. But silence on this occasion will virtually have been a denial of his identity and mission. Likewise, silence on our part under some circumstances is a denial of Christ. An open and verbal denial as Peter's is not the only way to betray our Lord. And so, who deserved to die in the whole case? Let us look at Jesus before the Sanhedrin, Leman, page 140, and see who deserved to die at that point. And also looking at the criminal code of the Jewish the book by Benny, page 73 and 74. We read from this uh, laws thus. The rending of his priestly robes not only disqualified Caiaphas to act as a judge, it brought upon his own head the very sentence that he was seeking to impose upon Jesus. The Mosaic code did not permit a high priest to uncover his head. And if he should rend his sacred priestly garment, the penalty was death. You can check that in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6 and 21, verse 10. In fact, we can go there very quickly. Leviticus 10, 6. In the book of Leviticus 10, 6, just to be sure what we are reading. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eliezer, and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. But let you breathe in the whole house of Israel, beware the burning which the Lord has kindled. Again, in uh, Leviticus 21, verses 10. Leviticus 21 verses 10. Leviticus 21 verse 10. And he that is, this is where I'm reading, and he that is the high priest among his brethren upon whose head the anointing oil was poured and that is consecrated to put on the garment shall not uncover his head nor rend his clothes. And so that was the law, the, the, the mosaic code. But we find that uh, the high priest Caiaphas rained his priestly garment and covered his, his head. And so uh, Lehman page 140 says that he was worthy to die. And here the official garment of the of the T high of the of the high priest was not only symbolic of his sacred office in which he was the type of Messiah, but his garments also represented the imputed and imparted righteousness of the Son of God. Such an act was also the evidence of a rage that was beneath the dignity of the high priest. In this effort to show his horror and indignation because of the confession of Jesus, 
Caiaphas pronounced himself guilty of death and thus wholly disqualified himself to preside over the Sanhedrin. An ordinary Israelite would as an emblem of bereavement, bereavement tear his garment. But uh, to the high priest it was forbidden because his vestments being made after the express orders of God were figurative of his office. This is Jesus before the Sanhedrin by Lehman, page 140. The balloting that condemned Jesus was also irregular. According to the Hebrew law, in a criminal case, the judges must vote one at a time, beginning with the youngest. Each in his turn had to arise and cast his vote and then state his reason for his decision. Both the vote and the reasons for it must be recorded by the scribes. That Jesus was condemned by acclamation is evident from Matthew 26, 66 and Mark 14, 64. An authority on Hebrew law says, in ordinary cases, the judges voted according to seniority. The oldest commencing in a capital trial, the reverse order was followed. That the younger members of the Sanhedrin should not be influenced by the views of arguments of their more mature, more experienced colleagues, the junior judge was in these cases always the first to pronounce for or against the conviction. You can search the records for a, such a proceeding during the trial of Jesus Christ and you will never find it. Jewish writers have also stated this law in such a clear terms as to leave no doubt as to what course should have been followed at the trial of Jesus. Let the judges each in his turn absolve or condemn. This is Mishnah said Henry, and this is 25. The desperate attempt of Judas Iscariot to save Jesus from death raw fails. The evidence of the guilt of the judges of Jesus was demonstrated when Judas returned the bribe money and publicly confessed that he had betrayed the innocent blood. In the book of Matthew 2, 27 verse 1 to 6 and in Acts 1 19 we are told that this was done so public that it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem. The members of the Sanhedrin could not even deny their guilt. Judas had been a witness to the entire proceedings against Jesus and the injustice of his treatment was so manifest and so flagrant that his conscience was smitten with guilt. He knew that Jesus was innocent and the final sentence of death by acclamation was more than he could stand. He will now testify in behalf of him who had no intercessor. As the trial drew to a close, Judas could endure the torture of his guilty conscience no longer. Suddenly, a hoarse voice rang through the hall, sending a thrill of terror to all hearts. He is innocent, spare him. O oh, Caiaphas, the tall form of Judas was now seen pressing through the startled throng. His face was pale and hazard, and great drops of sweat stood on his forehead. Rushing to the throne of judgment, he threw down before the high priest the pieces of silver that had been the price of the Lord's betrayal. The perfidy of the uh, priest was revealed. It was evident that they had bribed the disciple to, be, to betray his master. This is in Desire of Ages, page 721, 721 and 722. It is well known fact that many of the judges of Jesus were not only degenerate and corrupt in character, but that they had purchased their seats in the council and were making merchandise of their offices. In fact, several of them had grown rich by this means. This was especially true of the family of the high priest. Now, it is historically true that Annas and Caiaphas and their friends owned and controlled the stalls, booths, and bazaars connected with the temple, and from which flowed a most lucrative trade. The profits from the sale of lambs and doves sold for sacrifice alone were enormous. The trial of Jesus, that is Chandler, volume 1, page 304. When Jesus denounced this man for making his father's house a house of merchandise and a den of thieves, and on two different occasions cleansed the temple of its unholy traffic, he not only wounded the pride and dignity of Annas and Caiaphas, but dealt a severe blow at their most lucrative source of income. This was one of the chief reasons for their bitter enmity. Taylor Bunch continues to say, In John 19, 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that he may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priest therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. 
Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that, that saying, he was the more afraid. In John 19.8, When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid. While Jesus was accused only as a disturber of the peace of the nation, which accusation Pilate knew to be false, he knew who could deliver him, because the judgment in that case belonged to himself. But when the Jews brought a change, a charge against him of the most capital nature from their own laws, he then saw that he had everything to fear if he did not deliver Jesus to their will. The Sanhedrin must not be offended. The populace must not be irritated. From the former, a complaint must be sent against him to Caesar. The latter might revolt or proceed to some acts of violence, the end of which could not be foreseen. Pilate was certainly to be pitied. He saw what was right, and he wished to do it, but he had not sufficient firmness of mind. He did not attend to that important maxim, fiat justitia, ruat scaulum, let justice be done, though the heavens should be dissolved. He had a vile people to govern, and it was not an easy matter to keep them quiet. Some supposed that Pilate's fear arose from hearing that Jesus had said he was the son of God. Because Pilate, who was uh, a polytheist, believed that it was possible for the offspring of the gods to visit mortals, and he was afraid to condemn Jesus for fear of offending some of the supreme deities. The question in the succeeding verse refers to this. And went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, When art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. He already knew Jesus was from Galilee. This question must be referring to more than his coming from Galilee. And so, Pilate's challenge to the Jewish to take the law into their own hands and crucify their own prisoner was met with the revival of the religious charge on which they had sent him Jesus to die. The Jewish answered him, we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. When therefore, when Pilate therefore heard that saying he was more afraid in John 19, 7 to 8. The repeated declaration of Pilate that Jesus was innocent of all criminal and political offenses charged against him caused the Jewish in their desperation to revive the indictment of blasphemy, which according to Hebrew law was a form of prison meriting the death penalty. This, cha this change in the indict indictment was an acknowledgement that the other charges were false and that the real issue with them was a religious one. The statement that Jesus ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God filled Pilate with superstitious dread. It had the opposite effect than was intended by the Jewish. In Roman mythology, there were many legions of the sons of God visiting the earth in human form and as such, they were indistinguishable from mortal beings. To offend or to ill-treat these gods in the guise of men was a very serious offense, bringing down the anger of the gods. In Acts 14, 11 to 5 is an example of this belief. The miracles of Paul and Barnabas convicted the people of Lystra that the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Again, Taylor Bunch says, The dream of Claudia doubtless came back vividly to the mind of Pilate, and he was more convinced than ever that Jesus was a as he claimed to be. To quiet his own fears and, if possible, to obtain a further explanation from Jesus as to his origin and mission, Pilate again led Jesus back into the praetorium on the pretense of investigating the new charges brought against him. Pilate went again in the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, when art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee had the greater sin. John 19, 9 to 11. Jesus remained silent to the question of Pilate as to his origin. Pilate knew that Jesus was from Galilee and had been reared in Nazareth, but this was not the information he was after. He was inquiring as to whether or not his claim of sonship with God was true. Perhaps Jesus remained silent because an explanation could not have been understood by Pilate, and anyway, his answer would have nothing to do with the merits of the case. 
Pilate remain, remain, reminded Jesus that his supreme authority over him demanded the courtesy of an answer and that it would be to, to his advantage to honor him with a reply to his question. Otherwise, he might be guilty of contempt of court. Jesus then reminded Pilate that his authority was restricted by a high power and that all governmental authority was delegated to man from above. He also told him that while he would be held responsible for his share of the traversy, traversy on justice, the greatest blame will rest upon the Jewish who delivered him into his hands and were clamoring for his blood. This has been the judgment of mankind. And um, actually, it was something so astonishing that even after the dream of uh, Pilate's wife, he went ahead and crucified Jesus Christ. How many times we have evidence of what is true, but because we have to please somebody, we go all the way doing the wrong. So with the greater life these Jewish people had, they must bear the greatest guilt also. Pilate greatly appreciated Jesus' statement that Jews were the principal offenders of the crime. But in appreciating it, he thought that he could actually uh, uh, um, free himself from the condemnation. But actually, we find in the book of Acts, Peter saying that Pilate also is guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. When it is in our power to do good and we do evil, it doesn't matter who started the argument or the accusation. When we go to side with the, the people, with the mob, then we are as guilty as the people themselves. In fact, I just want to show you a verse which uh, is interesting. Thou shall not follow the multitude to do evil. This is um, from uh, the book of Exodus chapter 23 verses 2. I'll try and see. Exodus 23.2 Thou shalt not raise a false report, put not thine hand with the wicked to be unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Neither shalt thou countenance a poor man in his cause. Uh, that is what... Um, we are told, thou shalt not follow the multitude to pervert judgment, but the judges and Pilate, this is all they did. They followed the multitude to really deny Jesus Christ the very uh, uh, justice that he needed. The Jewish people once more shifted tactics upon every occasion to make sure that uh, Christ was. Uh, are delivered for crucifixion. And this really played on the mind of Pilate because of his political interest. And we see that happening with Herod and happening with Agrippa and uh, their end was not a good ending. And so uh, when Pilate became scared, he tried three times to free uh, Jesus Christ, but being uh, fearful of the revolt and being accused to Caesar and losing his job, he gave in to the threat of these people. The threat of the Jewish that they would appeal to the case, the appeal the case to Caesar was not an idle one. They knew that a large delegation to Rome with the complaint that Pilate refused to execute one who claimed to be king and was thus guilty of treason would have great weight uh, with suspicious Tiberius. And remember Herod himself saying that, go see the king and come and tell me. And after that, Herod killed all the children under two years. And so any case that could be submitted to Rome um, of anyone trying insurrection would place the tetriarch in a problem who ruled under someone else. They had appealed to the emperor on two or three previous occasions and got what they demanded to the embarrassment of Pilate. 
Pilate knew that such an appeal would cost his position and probably his life. So the threat had the desired effect on the vacillating governor. And then he began to waver. Now, the struggle had assumed a different aspect altogether. It was no longer between justice and expediency so much as between justice and position. And position was dearer to Pilate than justice. He was now virtually on trial for his position and perhaps for his life. Now, this was not just a trial on Jesus, but it was a trial on Pilate too. And fearing for his own trial, Pilate had to give in. Either he or Jewish must be sacrificed and he decided that he would save himself at the expense of the one who had five times been declared guiltless. His respite, however, was short-lived for a complaint of the Jewish a little later brought an order from the governor of Syria that Pilate appear before Tiberius to answer the serious charge against him. He was relieved of his office and according to Eusebius, worried with his misfortunes, he committed suicide. The oft repeated saying of Jesus was thus fulfilled. He that findeth his life shall lose it and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it in Matthew 10, 13, 9. And uh, this is what... Uh, we see happening with uh, those who can stand with Jesus Christ. That uh, at the end of the time, uh, if you deny Jesus Christ, he shall deny you before the Father and the holy angels. Our, our, our position today should be, and our question should be, can we be able to stand for the truth? when even the champions are few, to stand in defense of the truth, when champions are few. This is uh, our call, and uh, I'd like to read this quote as uh, we bring this to a close. To stand in defense of the truth. And... Uh, this is uh, uh, hold on to stand. Stand in defense of the truths. This is from last day events, page 180, paragraph 4. This is what actually was missed. We never had a person in that trial of Jesus Christ that would go all the way with this. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. And this is the point that many missed in the trial of Jesus Christ. We have seen how the Sanhedrin had the loss that if it was followed, they could have freed Jesus Christ. We have seen the mob who are influenced by the leadership to make sure that Jesus Christ did not have justice. And the same history is repeating itself today. And every one of us must decide. Would I be on the side of the leaders or would I be on the side of Christ if, even if it demands death? And so uh, another issue I want, us, I want to raise is uh, this issue of uh, neutrality in time of uh, uh, neutrality in time of religious crisis. Because when we look at the issue of Jesus Christ, it was not just a political issue, it was a religious issue, and the religious leaders are the ones who brought him to crucifixion. 
And so we are told what astonishing deception and fearful blindness had like a dark cloud covered Israel. This blindness and apostasy had not closed about them suddenly. It had come upon them gradually as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning which the Lord had sent to them because of their pride and their sins. And now in this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priest and the apostate king, they remain neutral. Now, the statement I want is this, if God abhors one sin above another, if which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case, in, in case of an emergency. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and are equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. This is the charge that many will have at the trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Neutrality and the sin of silence. In uh, in the book uh, of uh, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 25, the book of Leviticus chapter 25, this is also what we read. Um, sorry, the book of Leviticus. Scene of silence. And uh, in the Leviticus, let us see Leviticus chapter five. Verses 1, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 5, verses 1. We read, And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing, and is a witness, whether he hath seen or known of it, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. And so, Many people in that crowd who had seen the works of Jesus Christ and could not come forth as a witness for fear to them was seen and they needed to do a corporate repentance as a nation. And so if you look at from Gethsemane to Calvary and everything that happened with Jesus Christ in the hands of uh, the in the hands of the Jewish leaders and in the presence of the people, you will see a nation that was sold into the hands of the evil one. Because it is these people that wanted to do a revolt if Jesus Christ was not crucified. How does this relate to us today? Uh, in closing. That is uh, upward look, page 133. I, I believe that is the place. Upward look, uh, uh, look. At um, this, this is uh, upward look, page 131, not 133. Now, God gives men the light, but many are filled with self-sufficient mastery spirit, and they strive by carrying out their own ideas to reach a height where they will be as God. They place their mind fast as if God must serve with them. Here lies the danger. Herein lies the danger in this. Unless God shall in some way make these men understand that he is God and that they are to serve him, human inventions will be brought in that will lead away from Bible truth, notwithstanding all the cautions that have been given. And this is what actually the Jewish people are, are, are drifted into. Instead of relying on God, they relied on their own wisdom. And they went away from the Bible truth instead of upholding it. And so what happens? 
the Lord Jesus will always have a chosen people to serve him. When the Jewish people rejected Christ, the Prince of Life, he took from them the kingdom of God and gave it to another, or to, he gave it unto the Gentiles. Now, listen to this, brothers and sisters, as we pray. God will continue to work on this principle with every branch of his work. When a church proves unfaithful to the word of the Lord, whatever their position may be, however high and sacred they are calling, the Lord can no longer work with them. It doesn't matter what name they have. Even they can call themselves Jesus Christ. They can call themselves Messiah, whichever name they will want to call themselves. However high they are calling, if they do not accomplish the work of the Lord, the Lord will continue working on the same principle he worked with the Jewish people. He will leave them alone, it says. Others are then chosen to bear important responsibilities. But if these in turn do not purify their lives from every wrong action, if they do not establish pure and holy principles in all their borders, then the Lord will grievously afflict and humble them, and unless they repent, will remove them from their place and make them a reproach. Now, we hear every time people say the church, the church, it is going through, it doesn't matter. And we hear this issue, this is the last church. There is no other church. Yes, this is the last church. But when God gave the people responsibilities, he never earmarked them that they cannot be lost if they sin in impunity. We can be having the last church, but that does not mean those are the last people. God will have a people and he will continue to work with them if the church proves unfaithful in its borders. And uh, so the people who say the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, they were warned and we are being warned today in Jeremiah, the Je book of Jeremiah chapter 7. The book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the Lord. The, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that enter in these gates to worship the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and I'll cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are this. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your heart. Look at this. Not walk after other gods. We have seen all injustices being done. We have seen people change their gods, and yet still they say the temple of God, the temple of God. Then if they do not amend this, uh, then will I cause you to dwell in this place if you amend your ways in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying work that cannot profit. Will you steal? Will you murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, said the Lord. But go in now unto Shiloh, but, but go in now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all this work, said the Lord, and I spake unto you rising up early and speaking, but he had not, I'll, and I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house which is called by my name, where in he trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, and I'll cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Leave him alone. That is Ephraim, he's joined unto idols and these gods. Therefore, pray not thou for these people, neither lift up, nor cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I'll not hear thee. What are they doing? Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their down to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out bring offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, said the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Therefore, said the Lord, behold, mine anger and my fury 
shall be poured out upon this place, upon man, and upon beast, and upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn, and shall not be quenched. And so, uh, after seeing the history of the Jewish people, and looking at our own history, and what is happening right now, it seems that the very things that these people are steeped in are the very things that the church, which calls itself by the name of God, is. And it were as if it is the second trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the person of his saints. I pray that we may learn from the story of the Jewish nation and how they came to the point of crucifying Jesus Christ, how every law was violated. Think about this as uh, uh, we, 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 we pray. When people are condemned in the church for some wrongdoing or believing not as the purported lawyers, Sanhedrin, the rabbis, purport they should believe, there are no fair trials. They are dismissed. The seeds are broadcasted abroad. Some are the worshippers, some are Illuminati, some are this and some are that. So that they may be hated by all nations and even by their neighbors, their parents, their children and all that stuff. Families are being broken because the current Sanhedrin and the people are just behaving the very same way they behaved with Jesus from Gethsemane to Calvary. And Jesus said, there's coming a time they'll put you out of their synagogues because they never knew the Father or never knew me. And I have told you before time so that when it happens, you might know that I'm he. And so these things have been prophesied that the, the attitude and the, tri the trials and the attitude of the children of Israel prior to the first coming are the same trials and attitude of the church of God before the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we read these statements, we should humble ourselves and ask, what were these trials? What were their attitudes? How did they behave? Are we repeating the same things? For we may find ourselves that we are just crucifying Jesus Christ by trying to defend something. The people then defended their nation from being taken away by pagan Rome. The church in this time will defend their churches from being taken by papal Rome. Same Rome, different stages, same things being repeated. I just pray that the Lord may open the eyes of Laodiceans, that they may see these things and repent when it's not too late. We need corporate repentance as a church, as a people, including me. And then we need individual confession and repentance for the things we have once participated in and the things we are participating in, corporately and individually. May the Lord bless us and uh, may we meditate upon these things. And may the grace of the Lord continue being with us. Let us pray that the Lord will give us his spirit that uh, we may not be left grappling in darkness while uh, there's still light, let us, let us use it to let our light shine so that the light in us may not turn into darkness. Shall we pray? Our Father, which art in heaven, humbly we come before thee. In our old past, these are the things that we used to do. And even after accepting you, we find still the elements of the ancient, um, of uh, the, uh, the, the old Jewish people in us, in that trial of your son. Lord, how we just pray that you may forgive us, you may cleanse us, you make us whole, that you may open our eyes, for you say that we may come and you may anoint us that we may see. That anointing, we need it as a church, we need it as individuals, we need it as families, so that, Lord, we may not think that we are defending religion when we are crucifying, crucifying your son in the form of persecuting your saints. And so thank you because you have said, a conrite heart thou shalt not uh, cast aside. And so we came, you have promised, if we confess our sins, you shall forgive us the way we have treated our brethren, the way we have treated each other, 
has been nothing short of murder. We have hated each other and you say whoever hates his brother in their heart is a murderer and whoever says a fool is um, in uh, jeopardy or in a uh, uh, place where he shall be judged and condemned. Please help us to even save our words for with this idol word so we shall be judged and praise and honor be unto thy name. Cleanse us and forgive us in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, may the good Lord bless us and continue speaking to our hearts and opening our eyes. Bye for now.